Hello everyone, welcome to COMP 359, Design and Analysis of Algorithms. In this video, I'm going to um, give a brief uh, recap of uh, asymptotic analysis, uh, what we have actually discussed uh, and learned in COMP 251, and I will introduce a few uh, new notations, lambda notations, uh, along the previous ones that you have learned about. So what is asymptotic um, analysis? Asymptotic analysis is a mathematical tool that helps us to analyze the efficiency, the time efficiency of the algorithms. Um, these tools can be used not only for uh, analyzing the uh, time complexity, time efficiency, we can use them to analyze, the, uh, analyze and measure the memory requirement for the algorithms or any data structure that we use as well. So the first thing to know about asymptotic analysis is that when we are analyzing an algorithm, the efficiency of an algorithm, uh, we need to define some variables uh, and we will analyze them, the, um, analyze the algorithms based on those variables. So what are the variables? The variables, in fact, uh, are going to help us to measure the size of the input. So, for example, you are working on um, a list of um, uh, integers in an array and you are uh, looking for um, a specific item or you are looking for a maximum item over uh, a list of uh, integers, uh, right? So, what is the size of the uh, input which is given to you, the size of the input is going to be the size of the array. So the number of items in that array or list, input list is going to be the variable uh, which determines the size of the, the input. Uh, in many problems, uh, we just have one variable that determines the size of the input. In some problems, you might actually have more than one variables. For example, if you are working on uh, some matrix uh, more than uh, with two dimensions or three dimensions that the dimensions are of different size, uh, you have more than one variables that determines the size of the input, the size of that matrix that you are working on. Or for example, if you are working on a graph, the number of vertices is one variable, the number of edges is another variable that both of them um, will determine the size of the um, input graph that you are working on. Okay, so after you recognize what is your uh, variable, the input size, the very first step to analyze an algorithm is going to, uh, in fact, define the amount of time that we need to execute the algorithm. So when we are saying we are analyzing an algorithm, in fact, we, we, we are interested to know if I execute this algorithm on a computer, how much time it would take. I'm not interested in the actual timing because the actual timing would depend on many different uh, properties, many different actual conditions, which computer I'm running on, uh, how many actually other programs are, or algorithms are uh, simultaneously running on the computer and many other, uh, you know, uh, attributes and features that we are not going to actually go through those details. So to be able to abstract away all these details and just think about how much time this specific algorithm needs, we, uh, we actually count the number of primitive instructions that a computer needs to execute the algorithm. So. What is a primitive um, instruction? In all the modern computers um, that uh, we call them actually uh, word and RAM models, uh, a set of instructions that can be done, we have a, um, you know, um, we have a circuit on the computer for them. I, I'm not going to actually go through the details, but you, I'm sure you have uh, learned in um, computer architectures that um, a set of instructions that can be uh, done in one unit of time on in a computer, we call them the primitive instructions. To simplify it, the list of primitive instructions that uh, we will consider are going to be 
all the boolean instructions like and or not comparison operators less than greater than not equal equal arithmetic operations bitwise operations and reading um one um in fact one cell of the memory or writing in one cell of the memory all of these are going to be considered as uh, primitive um, instructions okay so we can in fact assume that on any computer each of these primitive instructions are going to take one unit of time so um, in this way we abstract away the details of the machine and just saying that okay count how many instructions how many primitive instructions this algorithm would need so in this way it doesn't matter which computer you are running on i can uh, say if this algorithm is faster than another algorithm or not so let me actually show you um, an example um, assume i have an algorithm a simple algorithm to uh, find the maximum item in a list of integer numbers some uh, which are or some random integer numbers um, the algorithm is very simple you uh, started from the very first item and you um, compare and check all of the items to find the maximum one right so i have written a simple java uh, piece of code here we wanted to count how many primitive instructions we have in uh, for this algorithm. If you um, look here, you can actually see that, okay, I have uh, one assignment here. So this is going to be one simple instruction. Um, I have a loop here. So the whole content of this loop will uh, repeat and uh, I should know that how many times this loop is going to repeat. But I have one simple instruction here so one, I have a comparison that will be repeated as many times as the uh, loop will be repeated. I have an increment of the um, counter variable of the loop. I have a comparison here. So um, two simple instructions for here and one simple instruction for here that all of them needs to be multiplied by the number of uh, repetitions of this loop. And these instructions that I don't know how many times it's going to be executed, but I know that this is going to be something between zero and the maximum number of instru uh, the maximum number of um, iterations of this loop. So how many iterations I have? The number of iterations would depend on this initial value of the counter and the upper one that I have defined, which is going to be the size of the array. So remember that variable that uh, we had, the size of the input, which is n, this is going to give me that mm, this information that the number of iterations of the loop is going to be n, right? And the number, uh, the maximum number of times that these instructions can be executed is going to be n as well. So if I summarize all of this information, I can actually come up with a formula. Whatever is going to be the number of instructions that I need is going to be between 3 plus 3n and 3 plus 4n, right? And that's because I don't know how many times these instructions will be executed. It just depends on uh, what values you have in the array. For example, if the array is already sorted, this is going to be executed n minus 1 times if it is... Uh, if the maximum item is at the very first, this is going to be executed zero times and so on. So this is just the details. What here really matters for me is that whatever is the number of simple instructions that I have, this is going to be something between 3 plus 3n and 3 plus 4n. But whatever it is, I can write it as a formula, a simple formula like this. That's going to be c n plus c prime. That uh, where c and c prime both of them are some constants right so i don't know exact the exact value of them but i know that this is going to be some constant values uh, multiplied by n plus some other constant values so this is this formula is going to be the time function for the algorithm now the next step is to okay after you got the time function for your um, algorithm uh, we wanted to compare, for example, two different algorithms and know that which one is going to be more um, efficient, which one is faster, right? That's going to be the comparison of some uh, time functions like this. 
still we have some details in such functions that's why we introduced a couple of notations that we call them lambda notations um, remember we have talked about the o big o notation and theta notation right so um, both of these two notations are talking about the growth ratio of the functions okay so let's just actually compare these two before i introduce the uh, big o notation i wanted to briefly talk about the growth ratio of the functions assume i have these two functions f of n which is n power 2 and g of n which is n power 2 minus 3 n plus 2 so if you have these two functions uh, assume that the, these are the time function for two different algorithms how good um, is these two algorithms and which one is going to be better okay if i compare these two functions I, I need to compare the diagram of them. I, I should know that which one is going to be greater than the other one, the value of which one, depending, and all of it will depend on the value of n, right? So if I look at the diagram of these algorithms in a smaller scale, the behavior of them would look completely different. At first, the g of n is higher, and then later the f of n is going to be bigger, right? But if I look at the diagram of these functions in a larger scale you can barely distinguish between these two diagrams they look very similar to each other so it means that the we are saying that the growth ratio of these two functions are the same and if you have two algorithms that has the time function with these two functions we would not really actually uh, consider any difference between them both of them are going to work uh, uh, in terms of the time they work the same and we would say that they uh, both have the same growth ratio they both have the same time complexity let me give you another example look at these two polynomial functions f of n is n power 6 and uh, g of n is this uh, big uh, complicated formula here Again, if I look at the diagram of these two functions in a smaller scale, I would uh, see that they look completely different. At first, um, g of n is uh, smaller, then it is bigger, then again it is smaller. But if I look at the diagrams at a larger scale, just like previous uh, example that we saw, you can barely distinguish between these two diagrams. We would say that the growth ratio of these two functions are the same the behavior of them are the same when n approaches to infinity this is really important why because n here is uh, in fact it stands for the size of the input that you are working on if the size of the input that you are working on is very small we don't really care about the behavior of these functions that's why i'm saying that when n approaches to infinity when n grows how would uh, these two functions behave both of them would behave the same so we would say that the time complexity of them are going to be the same so everything that we are actually discussing here is just about the growth ratio of the functions when they when the value of that variable n is approaching to infinity just before I uh, leave uh, this one and uh, introduce the big O notation, the mathematical definition of that, I wanted to discuss about this fact that in these two previous examples that we saw, in the first one, the biggest term was n power 2. So when we look at the, um, the, you know, the diagram, of course, both of them would actually just... Uh, look the same at the same point or in the second one the largest term for both of them were n power 6 right that's why they um, actually just uh, you know sit over each other when you are actually looking at the diagram in larger scale even if the um, you know not only the uh, the biggest terms were the same the coefficient of the biggest terms were the same as well the coefficient of both of them was uh, where n uh, where one sorry yeah um, but even if the coefficient of some one of them was different for example one of them is 100 
n power 6 and the other one is this one the difference between the diagrams would be something like this that the one of them would just behave like the other one just it is um, you know shifted for um, that um, the coefficient amount that you have actually multiplied to that it will be shifted on um, the y um, axis right so um, still the growth ratio is going to be the same so it is very important to know that we don't care about the coefficient of these biggest terms but we just care about the the main term because those are uh, uh, actually giving us the information about the growth ratio so even having some larger coefficient multiplied to those terms are not going to change the the growth ratio right it's still the behavior of the functions look the same it's just going to be shifted a little bit on the y-axis so now let's just um, mathematically define this big o notation we would say that a function f of n is in big o of g of n if there exist two positive constants n and c such that for all the values of n greater than this big n always f of n is smaller than or equal to c multiplied by g of n so what it actually this um, although it might look a little bit complicated at first but big o just tells you that g of n is an upper bound over the growth ratio of f of n so f of n is in big o of g of n if g of n is an upper bound on the growth ratio of f of n so the only difference between them is going to be um, just by applying some c you make g of n greater than f of n when n approaches to infinity Okay, let me actually show you some example here. For example, if I have f of n equal to this one, can I say it is in big O of n power 3? If you wanted to prove, um, if you wanted to solve a questions like this, what you need to do is to just find these two values of n and c such that this um, relationship, this um, inequality, uh, sorry it's not in quote this formula is going to be satisfied so here what I need to do I need to just find what is the value of c and what is the value of n so that f of n is going to be a smaller than or equal to c multiplied by g of n for all the values of n greater than big n so what is going to be the, these values I can actually say that if I choose c equal to 3 and big N equal to 1, this formula will be actually satisfied. This relation will be satisfied, right? I always know that. Um, let me actually choose a different color. So, I have three terms of n. This was not the one that I was looking for. Okay. So, this is going to be... Oh, my God. Okay, color. So, this is going to be... Three terms of n, I'm sh for sure... If you multiply 3 to n power 3, this is going to be always greater than all these terms because n power 3 is going to be greater than n power 2 and greater than n, right? For all the values of n greater than 1. So uh, usually when you are actually working on an example like this, um, you just need to find these two constants to to just prove this statement if you are looking for the big o notation for a function like this you can simply just think about the largest term and that's going to be the big o notation for uh, the function a couple of interesting facts about the big o notation uh, 
for the algorithms that we usually work on, uh, there are um, a couple of different sets of uh, classes of the big O, uh, which are uh, which we are more interested to them. Uh, the first one is going to be the the class of um, algorithms that uh, works in uh, constant amount of work. Then larger than that, it is going to be the class of algorithms that works in logarithmic time. Then the class of algorithms that works in um, a square root. So square root and if the actually the this is going to be of um, different the root of three for example that these are going to be of different classes okay so if the it is the root of uh, three this is going to be different than the square root and then after that um, this is going to be the linear time algorithms n log n n power two or n square n cube and then after that the exponential one one very interesting thing about the big O notation and this set of algorithms is that big O notation will create a subset superset relationship between these classes of um, algorithms. So all the algorithms that takes constant amount of work would um, actually fall in this um, set here. That is going to be the subset of all other algorithms that uh, they are in um, uh, other actually big O notations, okay? And you can see that it doesn't matter how big or how uh, small, if the amount of time that your algorithm would need is constant, it doesn't depend on N, we would say that this algorithm is going to work in constant amount of time. And this is the best algorithm that you can find to do um, to do anything, right? And we actually just show them with um, O of 1. So this is just a representation for this set. And then the next superset, the next set, which is going to be a superset of constant, this is going to be O of uh, logarithm. Uh, one nice thing about the logarithm algorithms is that logarithmic algorithms is that um, it doesn't matter what is the base of the logarithm, all of them are going to fall in the same class. Later on, I, I will actually just review that why um, they, are, they will be in the same class because they can uh, convert it to each other by multiplying to just a, a constant. And then after that, the linear, then the n square, um, and then the exponential ones. And be careful if you are working on an exponential um, uh, algorithm, uh, the base of the exponential is going to be really important. So 2 to power n is going to be a different class than 3 power n. 3 power n is going, is going to be different class than 4 power n, and so on. Even if you have something like 1.1 1. 1 power n, this is going to give you a different class than 2 power n or others. So any base that you actually have in the exponential will create a different class of big O. So let me actually just give you a couple of um, quick question. So um, can I say that E power 3n is in big O of E n, E power n, uh, just because remember we uh, kept saying uh, constant factors um, coefficients are not going to uh, matter so you can actually pause the video think about it answer the questions and then come back and read the uh, answer here listen to the answer here so the fact is these two the e power 3n and en are not going to be in the same class the important thing Remember, I told you that the, all the exponential uh, functions that we have are going to be in different classes based on the base of the, the functions. And the reason here is you can just simply compare e of n and e uh, power 3n. Can you find any constant that make... Can you find any constant that make e power n greater than e power 3n by just actually dividing 
uh, e power n by um, e power 3n you can actually see that the value of c should be at least e power 2n this is not going to be constant this is a very big number and it not only be it is depending on n so definitely this is not going to be a constant so it's not possible to find such a constant that makes e power 3n smaller than uh, e power n so uh, be careful when you are working and then you are actually just um, ignoring the constants if that constants in is in the exponential part that's not going to be ignored Another question, uh, is it correct to say that uh, 10 power n is going to be in big O of 2 power n? Again, just because the constants are not important. I have been actually talking about this. Again, you can actually stop the and pause the video and uh, think about it, then come back and listen to the answer. Again, when you are actually comparing um, and checking a question like this, you need to think about it in this way that can I find some constant that make 2 power n greater than 10 power n? We can see that c should be at least um, greater than or equal to 5 power n, which is going to, um, which is not a constant value, right? So it's not correct you cannot actually say that 10 power n is in big o of 2 power n how about this um, question i have f of n equal to n a linear function can i say that it is in big o of n power 3 again you can pause the video think about it and then come back to listen to the answer so we go back to the definition of the big o the definition of the big o is just telling you that you should be able to find some c that makes this g of n greater than or equal to f of n and of course for any value of c uh, so greater than one and any value of n greater than n this um, relationship is has been actually satisfied right so always n power 3 for any value of uh, if you multiply it by 1 is going to be greater than n uh, greater than or equal to n so this is correct and this is just actually telling you coming back to this fact that big o is an upper bound notation right and just because exactly because it is upper bound notation it is not an exact notation to tell you what is the growth ratio of the function. So that's why we define another notation, which is called big theta. Big theta will give us, uh, you know, um, the exact growth ratio of the function. So uh, uh, Let's actually define the mathematical definition of that first, and then we'll actually come back to the more details about the, the big theta. Um, this definition is very similar to the big O. We would say that a function f of n is in big theta of g of n if there exists three positive constants like n, big N, c1 and c2 such that for all the values of n greater than big n c1 multiplied by gn is smaller than or equal to f of n and c2 multiplied by gn is greater than or equal to f of n so in big o notation we didn't have this part okay we just had this part that tells us the big O is going to be an upper bound. G of n would be an upper bound for f of n. But in this definition, the definition of big theta, we also have the this part that is telling me that g of n also can be an 
a lower bound for f of n. So g of n at the same time is an upper bound and a lower bound for f of n. So if it is the case, it means that the growth ratio of f of n and g of n should be exactly the same. The only difference between them is just some constant. These constants that you multiply them to make it a smaller or greater. Okay, so the growth ratio of f of n and g of n, if you are saying f of n is in big theta of g of n, the growth ratio of these two functions should be exactly the same. So let me actually show you a couple of examples. For example, if I have a function like this, f of n, is it is this in big theta of um, n? Yes, it is because I can't find two constants c1 and c2 that if I multiply c1 equal to 1 and c2 equal to 1 million 1, it makes n a smaller than a smaller than or equal to 1 million n and greater than or equal to 1 million n. Okay, so yes, Again, here, the coefficients doesn't matter, and the growth ratio of these two functions are the same because the big term of these are the same. Just the difference is going to be just the coefficients, the constants here. Okay, so if I come back to the previous questions, remember we have discussed that f of n equal to n is in big O of n power 3. This is correct but you cannot say that f of n is in big theta of n power 3. This is wrong. And the reason is that you cannot find any constant value that makes n power 3 smaller than n at the same time finding some, um, and makes it greater. This part, this part is not going to be satisfied. You can never find a constant value of c1 that makes c1 multiplied by n power 3 a smaller than or equal to n when the value of n approaches to infinity. It's not possible. So that's why this is going to be wrong. And it is very clear. When you are thinking about the theta, theta is talking about the exact time, uh, exact growth ratio. So the growth ratio of n would be definitely different than the growth ratio of n power 3. How about this one? Can we say that n power 3 plus n2 plus n is in big theta of n power 3? Uh, yes, we can. You can actually just simply find c1 that makes n power 3 smaller than or equal to n power 3 plus n2 plus n is smaller than n power 3 another c2. So c1, choosing c1 as 1 and choosing c2 as 3, um, this makes it actually uh, smaller here and greater here. And the reason is that the growth ratio of this function and this function are the same because the biggest term for both of them are the same. Um, other interesting fact about the big theta notation is that remember when we talked about the big O notation, big O notation created some subset superset between all those classes of, uh, you know, these big classes of the uh, functions, the algorithms that we define. But in theta notation, theta will create equivalence relation between these classes of uh, functions, not the superset, uh, subset, superset. What are the properties of the equivalence relation uh, relations? We have three properties for these relations. They should be symmetric, reflexive, and trans uh, transitive. I can actually mathematically prove all of this for you, that if f of n is in big theta of g of n, Definitely, g of n is also in big theta of f of n. Um, you know, the proof of this one is going to be very simple. I'm not going to through the details of that, but you can um, just think about it in this way, that if you can find two uh, constant values that makes g of n uh, 
smaller than and greater than f of n you can also find those constant values for the reverse of it as well and you know um if you think about it the g the theta function the theta notation tells us about the growth ratio of the functions and it is telling us the growth ratio of f of n and g of n are the same so definitely this is going to be symmetric this is going to be reflexive of course this one is very simple to prove and it is going to be transitive as well if f of n is in big theta of g of n and you have h of n that g of n is in big theta of h of n definitely f of n is going to be in big theta of h of n as well the proof of this one is also very um, simple you can actually just uh, prove that you can find the constants that makes them um, if this is true and this is true you can find some constants to prove that this is true as well so just like this um, diagram that we had for the big o that gives you this uh, sub, uh, subset relationship between the, all these classes i can actually show you another picture for the big theta big theta as I uh, mentioned before, is going to give you some um, equivalency relationship between the, the functions, right? So there is, um, so in fact, it is going to partition all the functions into disjoint sets. All those functions that falls in this class of theta, theta n power 2, they are going to be in the same class and there is no overlap between this class and any other class of theta because you are saying that all these functions are going to have the same growth ratio and it's not possible to have the, and this one and this class for example are not going to have um, any overlap because the growth ratio of n power 2 is smaller than uh, the exponential one or any other actually uh, class of functions Uh, here is just another example just for example telling you that all these examples that you can see here are going to be in the same class it doesn't matter how complicated is the formula if the biggest term look at them if the biggest term is n power 2 all of them are going to be in the uh, big theta of n square Okay, now I wanted to introduce three new notations that will complete the lambda uh, notations and lambda sim uh, symbols in asymptotic analysis. The next notation that we have is big uh, omega. Big omega actually stands for lower bound, just like the big O, which is for upper bound. Big lambda is just the reverse of that. It is standing for the lower bound mathematically if you wanted to define it it's going to say um, we would say a function f of n is in big omega of g of n if we can find uh, two uh, positive constants n and c such that c multiplied by g of n is going to be a smaller than f of n right so you can see that g of n is going to be a lower bound for the growth ratio of f of n just the reverse of the the big o another notation is little o so little o is related to o uh, the big o it is just going to be instead of being upper bound this is going to be a loose upper bound okay so if i defined it um, it is I mean, mathematically define it. This is going to say that a function f of n is in little o of g of n. If for any positive constant c, just be careful here, it's telling you that for any positive constant, it's not about finding a constant. It's just telling you that for any positive constant, c multiplied by g of n is going to be greater than f of n. So, this for any positive constant it is telling you that the growth ratio of g of n is strictly 
greater than the growth ratio of f of n. This is going to be a loose upper bound. Okay. It is telling you that even if c you define c to be a very a small number like ten power minus thousand. This is going to be a very a small, right? It doesn't matter how small is this constant, as long as it is a positive number, it's still c multiplied by g of n is going to be greater than f of n, which actually tells you that the growth ratio of g of n is strictly greater than the growth ratio of f of n. And the last notation is little omega, which is going to be loose, loose lower bound. Okay, so again, similar to the uh, omega, which is lower one, this is a lower one, but this is going to be a loose lower one. Again, here, we are saying that a function f of n is in little omega of g of n. If for any positive constant c, always, if you multiply c of n to g of n, this is going to be a smaller than f of n, which tells you that the growth ratio of f of n is going to be a strictly greater than g of n, or the growth ratio of g of n is going to be a strictly a smaller than f of n. It doesn't matter how big is going to uh, be the value of c, as far as it is going to be a constant value, uh, still it is going to keep a smaller than f of n when the value of n is approaching to um, infinity, right? It's just simply telling you that the growth ratio of f of n is o is definitely is strictly greater than the growth ratio of g of n. So g of n is a loose lower bound for f of n. This slide is just uh, you know summarizing all of these different uh, notations. The uh, little o, big o, theta, uh, big omega, and little omega. Um, we would say that, okay, the f of n the, is in big O of g of n, which means that g of n is a, a loose upper bound for f of n. The growth ratio of f of n is going to be a strictly smaller than g of n. So if I wanted to, you know, something that helps you to understand and when you are actually comparing two different functions um, and saying that, uh, for example, if it is in big O notation of something else, uh, you can actually refer to these formulas. When the value of n approaches to infinity, if you divide f of n by g of n, if the growth ratio of g of n is strictly greater than f of n, the result of this limitation is going to be zero, right? Because when you n approaches to infinity, the value of f of n is strictly is going to actually uh, be became a smaller and a smaller and a smaller than g of n and so it is going to be equal to zero if f of n is in big o of g of n which means that g of n is um, an upper bond for f of n but not um, a loose upper bond not a strictly greater than you can actually say that we would say f of n divided by g of n when n approaches to infinity will be some constant value. I didn't actually put any condition here. It can be 0, it can be 1, it can be any constant. But it is going to be something smaller than infinity, right? When you are actually just saying that this is going to be a smaller than infinity, it means that this is going to be... Um, to be constant because you are actually talking about it when n approaches to infinity. And if f of n is in big theta of g of n, this limit is going to be constant greater than zero. So this is not going to be zero and this is not going to be infinity. It means that this is going to be a constant value, which tells you that the growth ratio of f of n and g of n are the same. This is exactly the definition of theta, right? And uh, very similar for the uh, big omega and little omega. Uh, so for the big omega, this is going to be greater than zero. So it can be constant, it can be infinity. 
and for the big omega you definitely would say that it's going to be equal to infinity because the growth ratio of f of n is strictly greater than g of n so if you actually um, read your textbook you will see that these formulas are going to help a lot and you will see a lot of interesting examples in chapter 3 of your textbook, which is talking about the growth ratio. And um, it will actually explain all these uh, lambda notations, lambda symbols um, that we discussed here. Okay, let's just uh, wrap up the discussion with uh, some examples here. Um, so... I have this set of statements. Uh, you can actually pause the video and check that which statement is correct, which statement is wrong. Then you can actually come back and listen to the answer. So this statement, this is going to be correct. Of course, the uh, f of n, uh, the linear is uh, in big O of a linear because a big O is just the upper bound. This is not a loose upper bound. So this is correct. Um, how about this one? This is correct as well because big O is upper bound and n power 2 is a, an upper bound for n. Uh, how about this one? This is going to be wrong uh, because little o should be a loose upper bound. So uh, the growth ratio of this function should be strictly larger than the growth ratio of this one, which is not. They are going to have the same uh, growth ratio. How about this one? This is going to be correct. The growth ratio of n power 2 is definitely greater than, strictly greater than n. How about this one? This is going to be wrong because um, the growth ratio of n and n power 2 are not the same. And Tito is talking about the exact growth ratio. n power 2 is in... Uh, is in big um, omega of n yes it is because this is a lower bound of n power 2 this one is also correct because this uh, n power 2 is a lower bound for n power 2 and this is not a loose lower bound so this is going to be correct this one is also correct because Linear is a lower bound, a strict lower bound, uh, a loose lower bound for n power 2. So this is correct as well. How about this one? This is going to be wrong because n power 2 is not a strictly um, smaller than n uh, power 2. The growth ratio of that, they are the same. So the last one is wrong as well. Uh, just a couple of actually quick notes. Um, remember, we talked about the, the functions, the logarithmic functions, the logarithms, and also the exponential ones. Um, when we are working on two functions that have different bases of the logarithm, we would say that they are going to have the same, um, the same um, growth ratio. And the reason is that, for example, assume you have log of n in base b and log of n in base c, two different bases. These two functions can be converted to each other just by multiplying to a constant. And the reason is that I can write log of n in base b as log of n in base c divided by log of b in base c. This formula is just from the discrete math. If you don't remember it, I would recommend you to go back and refresh your knowledge of the discrete math. This is, you really need it a lot. We will refer to discrete math a lot of um, times in this course. So um, just refresh your knowledge of the discrete math, of course. So now you can see that log of n in base c and log of n in base, sorry, in base b and n in base c, the only difference here is just 1 divided by log of b in base c. Both b and c are constant, so this is going to be a constant value. So converting log of n in base b to log of n in base c, the only difference is just multiplying to a constant. So the growth ratio of any two logarithms 
no matter what is their basis, uh, they are going to be the same. But when we are talking the, about the exponential functions, it is not the same. If you have two functions, a power n and b power n, okay, one of them is going to be smaller than the other one, right? If they are not equal, one of them is going to be smaller than the other one. If you divide a power n to b power n, when you put it in the formula of the limit, when n approaches to infinity, of course, a divided by b is going to be smaller than 1, right? And so this, when you approach it to, when n approaches to infinity, this is going to be equal to 0. So they are not going to have uh, equal um, growth ratio. The growth ratio of the one which has the higher base is going to be greater than the other one. So this is not correct. For any exponential ones, the bases are going to be important. Not only the bases, the value in the power is also um, going to matter, and we have seen some example about that. Here I have a couple of uh, actually small facts that uh, might actually come to mind, and you might have these questions that uh, okay, so uh, not 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 this one. This one is going to be actually just a, an example. I would recommend you to do this um, example. This helps you a lot to understand this fact. You can actually, what is the example? It's just saying that assume that I have a function, uh, sorry, I have a machine, I have a computer that the uh, primitive operation in that machine can be executed in one primitive instructions can be executed in uh, 10 uh, power minus 12 seconds so this is going to be a, a very fast machine right so you can assume that if i have a, an algorithm that works in uh, 2 power n its time function um, is in 2 power n you can actually just uh, figure out what is going to be the biggest value of n, what is going to be the biggest size of the input that can be solved um, using this algorithm over the computer, over a computer that um, is as fast as um, this property. You can actually just solve it, and if you have any questions, we can discuss um, about it um, in during the office hours or during one of those face-to-face -face sessions. Um, this example is very interesting just to tell you that how bad the exponential algorithms are. Uh, so those, um, um, in fact, facts about the asymptotic analysis and different um, algorithms uh, with different uh, growth ratios. So although asymptotic analysis um, would um, you know abstract away a lot of the details. For example, it abstracts away uh, all the coefficients, all the smaller terms, right? So um, in terms of the asymptotic analysis, if you have two algorithms that one of them works in the time function for that is going to be n um, ln of n or log of n and the other one is going to be 100,000 multiplied by n, the asymptotic analysis tells us that the growth ratio of u of n is going to be linear, the growth ratio of t of n is going to be n log n, n log n. So of course the growth ratio of t of n is going to be greater than uh, u of n and you would choose u of n as your algorithm. But someone might actually just, um, you know, argue that the value of log of n here is going to be for an insanely large value of n can be greater than 100,000, which you have as a coefficient for n. This is correct. If really such condition, uh, you know, you actually just face as such a condition, you should you would better choose t of n over u of n, 
okay you would better choose the algorithm that has t of n as its time function instead of u of n but in practice it's almost impossible that you have an algorithm that with this a small coefficient and you have an al another algorithm with this big coefficient i'm not saying that it's completely impossible but it is uh, rarely possible that you come up with two different algorithms that the, the coefficient of one of them is insanely big and makes it in practice worse than the other one okay so um, although the the um, you know in terms of the asymptotic analysis the other one is worse than this one okay so i'm just saying that in practices rarely happen uh, but if it is the case, yeah, you can actually just, based on the condition that you are in, choose the one that is uh, faster. Another um, important thing that uh, is good to actually talk about here is that, um, again, um, if you um, are actually working on um, a problem and you come up with some um, algorithm that uh, for example, that algorithm is exponential and you come up with another algorithm that is linear but with a very, very large um, coefficient, like for example, comparing this to that the coefficient of n power 2 is very large that makes the function way bigger than 2 power n. Okay, if you have these two algorithms, this is very important to know that although in practice, you would say that, of course, the algorithm that works in 2 power n is going to be better. But this is very important that it is possible for that problem that you are solving, it is possible to find a polynomial time algorithm. Although it is, um, you know, the coefficient for that is very big, it doesn't really matter. The, the important thing that... Um, here you have is that yes this problem inherently um, is possible to be solved in polynomial remember in the previous video we have talked about the traveling salesman problem some problems we don't know if we can actually solve them in polynomial time or not some problems we could not yet find any polynomial time algorithm for them but even if someone actually could find um, a polynomial time algorithm but with a very insanely big coefficient that is a very important actually progress this is important to know that the time complexity of the algorithms tells us not only about the, the how much time it would take to solve the algorithm it tells us about the the properties of the problem the if the problem is inherently difficult to solve, inherently unsolvable, not unsolvable, I should say, inherently exponential, for example, or it is possible to solve them in polynomial time. So later on, you would actually, if it is polynomial, believe me, later on, someone would actually just find another algorithm to make this coefficient smaller and smaller. And at the end, you would find an efficient algorithm for, uh, for that problem. So, um, you know, the last thing that I wanted to discuss here before I wrap up this uh, video uh, about the asymptotic analysis is just um, a brief discussion about the computational models. At the very beginning of this discussion um, on asymptotic analysis, I told you that we, uh, when we are comparing two algorithms, when we are analyzing an algorithm, we would count the number of primitive instructions, right? And then based on that function, we would uh, just figure out what is the growth ratio uh, for um, that time function, and we would actually figure out what is the time complexity of the algorithm. This is important to know that the, uh, this model, the model that it is just based on the number of primitive instructions just works if you are working on a modern computer on a computer that works uh, uh, its um, model is word ram model so what is a word ram model a word ram model um, is a computer that has uh, has these properties it has access to memory and we would assume it is an infinite amount of memory yes of course in practice it's not possible to have infinite amount of memory 
but you can assume that this is just talking about this fact that okay you are solving a problem and you can assume that you have as much memory as you need you there is no restriction over the memory don't worry about the amount of memory that you have so one property is that the memory is unlimited the memory has been divided to some cells that each one has n bit for example it is um all of them has been the whole memory has been divided to uh, uh cells of 8 bit for example that's why we call it actually a word ram this is a random access memory and uh, it has been divided to um, actually some cells this is a word ram accessing to this or each cell is going to be constant so this is important if i'm reading this address this address whatever address accessing to that address is going to be con to be taking constant amount of work so this is another property of the this uh, type of model uh, so cpu have access to the uh, to the ram which is to the memory which is random access memory accessing to each uh, um, cell of the memory is constant doing the arithmetic operations doing the boolean operations um, doing the bitwise operations um, comparisons all of them can be done in cpu in constant amount of work cpu has some registers um, that uh, any operation over the registers will be constant amount of work uh, reading and writing any uh, information in the memory is constant amount of work so these are all the properties of this word ram machines okay and you know that all the modern computers that you are working on, all of them are uh, uh, word RAM models. You might actually just say that which computers are not word RAM model. I'm not sure if you have taken uh, Comp 382 um, or you have heard about the Turing machine. But yes, there are some other computers. There are some other computational models. Okay, like the Turing machine, that although the computation power of a Turing machine and these modern computers that we have are the same, it means that if you can solve a problem on a Turing machine, you can also solve the, that problem on, uh, for example, a word RAM model. The power is the same in terms of the computability, but the time that would take to solve a problem on a Turing machine would be completely different than the time that would take um, to solve it on a word RAM uh, model. So I can say that, for example, a simple algorithm like binary search can be executed on a word RAM machine in log of n. You have definitely actually heard about the uh, how to actually do the, the time complexity for binary search. And it is log of n. But if you do, if you write the same algorithm for a Turing machine, the time complexity for Turing machine is not going to be log of n anymore. The model of the Turing machine is completely different than the word RAM. It doesn't have any, uh, it doesn't have most of the properties for the word RAM that we have here. Okay, so I don't want to actually make it complicated. Just know that what we discussed about the asymptotic analysis is just um, based on the word RAM models, which are the regular computers that we are working on. Okay, so in fact, I'm done. And I think that this video have uh, has uh, became even more than one hour. Uh, I'm going to actually stop the video here. The uh, rest of the, uh, I have actually a couple of more um, slides in this uh, lecture that uh, usually if I'm in class, I would do it uh, in person with uh, students. I would recommend you to just go over these uh, slides because it is talking about a very interesting problem, which is called tree sum problem. And um, uh, I have actually explained three different algorithms and uh, with different time complexities and proving the correctness of each one. And in fact, um, reading these slides is going to help you to understand what we are going to do during the whole course. 
every uh, session except for um, this week and the next week that uh, I will actually keep talking about the uh, asymptotic analysis. After that, every week in this course, we will um, just actually, I will introduce uh, you a couple of problems. We will solve them, find um, some algorithm for that, and uh, we prove the correctness um, of the algorithm, and we analyze the algorithm. And what I would expect you in the exams are exactly the same. I give you a problem, you have to actually solve it, find an efficient algorithm for that, prove the correctness of your algorithm, and uh, also analyze the time complexity of that. So I would definitely recommend you to read these slides. They are um, self-contained, so um, I'm sure that if you read them carefully, you would understand what's uh, the whole actually procedure of finding all these um, different uh, algorithms that I have discussed for this problem. Uh, but if you had question, we you can actually uh, just attend the office hours or we can talk about it in our next uh, face to face session. Um, for reading of this week, um, chapter one that I told you that's uh, an introduction to algorithms. Um, also, please chapter two, which is uh, mainly the review of uh, from comp to fifty one, and chapter three, which is talking about the growth ratio, um, all the these five different lambda notations that we discussed, and a lot of interesting examples exercises you can find in chapter three of your textbook, uh, CLRS. Thank you.